I'm not very good at telling jokes. People tell me that I tell dad jokes, but so there's these two hydrogen atoms and they're uh, drinking late at night at some bar. And uh, they get thrown out because it's two o'clock in the morning and it's time to go home and they both live in the same water molecule, very far away. You can imagine there's some oxygen atom it's sitting like looking at the clock, wondering where these guys are. So they start walking home together about halfway home, and one of them, the first hydrogen atom's like, ah, oh, I, I, I forgot my electron back at the bar. And the second atom says, oh man, are you sure? And the first one says, yes, I'm positive. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's an, the end of the jokes. Um, yeah, so basically, here we are. Maybe I can get a laser pointer thingy here. Uh, we're in Convocation Hall, which was opened up in 1907. Bob Marley and the Whalers performed here in 1976. There was a speech, a kind of famous speech by Robert Mugabe here in the 80s. Uh, I, there's me. Uh, the class is going to end at noon. Uh, at least I'll try to, try to do that. Um, let's see what else we got here. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. Uh, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And there's some of their little logos there. That's uh, Huron-Wendat, which is sort of north and east of here. Uh, six Nations of the Grand River. Seneca is one of the six nations that's sort of south and more west. And then GTA is kind of like Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to work, study, and learn physics on this land. This is in the news. I don't know if Liz Ramona is here, but I saw one of my students submit it, made it to the U of T newspaper a couple days ago, so that was good to, good to see you. Welcome. Here's an outline. Um, who am I? Uh, how to reach me? What is physics? Let me see if I can get a... I had meant to put a remote. So this will cut up. Um, so you'll see this slide a couple of times as we go back and forth to it, but I'm going to start off with who I am. I've been a physics professor on the teaching stream here since 2004, so quite a little while now. I've got to plug it into the right thingy. One of these ones. Let's see if that works. Yeah. Uh, I was actually a student here many, many, many years ago, and it was a uh, fall of... 1989 that I was 17 years old and sitting sitting right here where, where you are and sitting beside I actually ended up sitting beside someone who ended up being a long it's a lifelong friend one of my best friends um, uh, I studied physics and astronomy that was my specialist here and then I went on to do a PhD at Penn State University uh, I'm not this is not me <laughs> I don't know who this guy is just forget about that this doesn't even look like me um, but I am on Facebook under Harlow Physics. Uh, sometimes I go on Snapchat. Hey, you want to do a Snapchat thingy? So it's actually, there's, there's a, I love Snapchat filters so much. So let's do a selfie for my story. You guys, are you guys okay to be with me? <laughs> let's hold it down. Hey, everybody. This is my class. Look at that. <laughs> oh, my God. So that's going to my story. Thank you. Okay. What else? Uh, I bike to work. like to hike around, stuff like that. These are, and I'm really excited. I am going to be your professor until December, and then another professor will take over in January for Physics 132, named Anya Harlick. You might see her around sometime. She's kind of busy today, but I will be inviting her in at some point to say hi to you all. This is me with my kids a few weeks ago. Um, so you can see uh, there's uh, Elizabeth, my oldest. There's Taryn, who's just turned 26. This is her 26th birthday. There's Zainab, who's 11. There's Mirage, who's 8. There's my wife, Saba. We're out in my backyard. How to reach me. There's my email. That's a pretty good way to reach me. You could phone me. I have a, like a, a I'm not going to give you my cell phone number, but that's my landline. So if you text to it, it doesn't really work. Um, Although I think it does try to translate it to some sort of audio text, and I just delete it, but uh, email's good. I also have office hours, so actually after this class, I'm going to walk out that door and stand around for half an hour in case you want to, 
uh, just say hi or if you have any questions. Uh, but also Mondays 2 to 3 and Thursdays, including <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> 10 to 11, I'm in uh, room 125B, which kind of looks like this. Uh, it's sort of got a capacity of, I don't know, how many people could get in there, at least 15 or something like that. Uh, if you even just wanted to come by and sort of work on your homework there or something, that's, that's fine if, if there's enough room. And there's also other tables around there, even if you, and it's glass walls, so if you come by, you'll see that. Um, and then also I'm on a Zoom call on Tuesdays from 3 to 4 in case, uh, in case you want to check, check that out. So I've got this Ed discussion board open in one of these other windows that you can't see. Where is it? And in fact, it looks like there's a couple of posts here. But basically what I was thinking is that uh, you, can, you can post on it. You can post anonymously, but I, would, I don't know why. I think you should just use your name. That's, that way I can kind of get back to you. And also, please be, please be nice. We're, I, don't, uh, I guess I'll be policing it, but we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> there's issues about learning catalytics I can see on here right now, so hopefully we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, there's been some discussion there. But I'll, I'll have it open, so even if something comes up right now, and you can either shout out if you want, <laughs> and I might hear you, or you could type it into the discussion board, and I, I might see it on my second laptop there. So that's some one way to communicate with me. I'd like to know what's going on, especially if if I do something really dumb on the board and like or on the screens, and there's a mistake or something. You can feel free to to shout out at me, and I'll try try to fix it up. Okay, so that's the end of the first of five things. I thought there's like 50 minutes, 10 minutes per thing. Maybe we can kind of get through five things. So this is, the, this is where we are. So you are here <laughs> um, in Convocation Hall. Uh, there's this big construction. So what this used to be was a nice field where you could play Frisbee. And they're doing a huge bunch of construction there. And at the end of it, apparently, it's supposed to be a nice field where you can play Frisbee, but with underground parking. So that's that. And then, you know, of course, there's my hall. You can see there's that's a bunch of solar panels on the roof. This is Bayon bookstores, kind of down there. There's Lash Miller. There's New College up there, and there's Earth Sciences. Anyway, uh, the building that's circled is MP McLennan Physical Laboratories. That is where your practical sessions will be meeting starting next week. There's nothing going on there yesterday or today, except just sort of training up TAs. Um, and next week, I still will actually be training your two TAs. But, or in Royal Will, but, um, but there will be ATA there waiting for you, um, and we'll talk about that a little later. I'm one of 60 physics professors in that building. Uh, Pius over <laughs> here is one of 40 technologists and administrators who's uh, setting things up for us and getting demos together. Um, there's 250 graduate students. You'll be meeting two of those who will be your, uh, your teaching assistants through the whole year for these two-hour practicals. We even have a physics library, <laughs> which you can go in and read about physics on the second floor of that tower part of the building. But you're going to be turning right and going into the north part of the building where the, the undergraduate labs are. And most of the, I guess, the theorists kind of work in the, in the tower part, and the experimental physicists are mostly in the basement of the, the whole building. So, anyway. Oop. I wanted to show you the, whoop, the Large Hadron Collider, just for fun. So I guess there's maybe six or seven faculty members who are experimental high-energy physicists who tend to go over to CERN. And CERN is the name of a, of a big physics facility in Europe. Uh, and this Large Hadron Collider kind of spans, goes across the border between France and Switzerland. And it is about 100 meters underground. You can see this is a picture of the actual tube itself. and it is 26 kilometers in circumference. And the idea is that you use these superconducting magnets, which are cooled down to liquid helium temperatures, and you accelerate uh, protons to 99.999% the speed of light in, in a circular path. And you actually get two beams going at the same speed, almost the speed of light, one clockwise, one counterclockwise, and then you, of course, cross the beams, crash them into each other, uh, and see what happens. And what happens is that you uh, all that energy comes together into a tiny, tiny little point, and then energy can be converted to mass by E equals mc squared, and you can get all these massive uh, exotic particles, such as this summer they even confirmed the first discovery 
of uh, a four charm uh, tetraquark. So. But there's lots of other areas of physics. Um, there's Earth, atmospheric, and planetary physics. There's biological physics. Uh, there's condensed matter physics, uh, you know, qu quantum optics. There's all sorts of uh, amazing things going on, going on in our department. And we also have a physics student union. So on the course webpage, there's something called outside links of interest. And one of them is FISU, the physics student union. So uh, it represents all students who are enrolled in a physics subject post or who are taking a physics course. And that includes you. So uh, Sam is here. Did you want to? We will just. I thought there was a second mic somewhere, but I don't know where that is. Is it there? So I don't have to take this one off. I think you have to turn it on. Hello? Nope. Uh, can this work? OK, uh, great. Uh, so my name is Sam. Um, I'm a third year astrophysics specialist. And I'm here as an executive member of FISU. Um, so as Prof. Parlo said, uh, we represent all students who are enrolled in a physics post or physics class. And this includes you, so you are all members of FISU. Um, FISU supports you in a number of ways. We host academic events and social events. For example, in a few weeks, we will be doing a Python workshop. So if you want to learn Python, that's a great way to. Um, and this afternoon, between 2 and 5 p.m., we'll be, we will be selling liquid nitrogen ice cream outside MP. Um, we also support students in other ways, such as giving academic and mental health resources. Also, later in the month, we will be filling an unfilled position uh, through an election for the first year representative. This is an executive position, so if you want to get more involved with the physics community, this is also a great way to do so. Um, and if you want to learn more about us, uh, you can find us on Discord and Instagram. Um, and that is our website up there, physio.org. Uh, you can find everything there. We post all of our events, resources, seminars, uh, everything like that. So definitely go check that out. Um, we also have a, lounge, a student lounge in MP217, which is on the second floor of the physics building. Um, and yes, feel free to stop by any time. We have a microwave free pr printing, free sanitary products, office supplies, and a cheap snack bar. So thank you. OK. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> awesome. All right. Cheers. Awesome. OK. That's two down, three to go. Yeah, so the next thingy is this um, is sort of an optional like audience participation part for which you kind of need a phone or a laptop to really participate in. So w it's not at all for marks. I, I guess I will be recording it somewhere, but it's this today's is just a completely practice trial run to show you sort of what it looks like. So, um, so let me just first introduce, this is the textbook. Uh, it's called College Physics Explore and Apply by Ed Kina. Um, at all, and uh, it looks like that. Um, it will be required reading. We go through fr uh, chapters, I guess, 1 through 11 in this course, and then when Professor Harlick takes over, she uh, starts in chapter 17, I think, and then goes through electricity, magnetism, optics, and ends up in special relativity, uh, chapter 26. So if, once you get the book, uh, it'll be useful for two courses. You don't have to buy another one in January for physics. And in addition to just reading the book, there's all these uh, online assignments on my lab and mastering worth up to 10% of your course mark. So, and when you go onto the Quirkus course site, you click on uh, my lab and mastering, there's actually an option there where you can get a two week free trial, which I highly recommend. So, you know, you can even do that right now and not have to worry about money or anything. Um, that sets up it with your account, and once you activate that account in the next couple of weeks um, with an access code that you have to purchase from the bookstore for $115, then it keeps everything that you've been doing for the last two weeks. So, so it's, there's really no downside to trying that if you, want, if you want to try it today. And so this is the test run. I'm going to start it, uh, Learning Catalytics. If I click on Deliver, Hopefully it sort of shows up here. Um, 
Learning Catalytics is the name of the system within my lab and mastering that I will be using for in-class polling. So I know this is kind of sounding a little <laughs> complicated, but I think you're going to get used to it, and that I think it can be, it can be good. It's the idea here is to get you thinking, active, and maybe talking to your neighbors about physics. Um, so, and today's class will not count towards your marks, but it, I'm going to record the answer somehow if you're able to get on. So you click on this LC Learning Catalytics, and hopefully you should be able to join the session. I've already started uh, this question. So maybe I'll wander around and see if anyone can do this from your end. But the question is, you have that short answer where you have to type somehow the name of, it, of one other student taking this course. So now this question is going to be open for, for 24 hours. Um, but uh, you could do it right now uh, by pairing up and introducing each other and then typing in your name. So I'm going to maybe set a timer for two minutes. I'm going to turn off my microphone and wander around a little bit. See if this is working. that helps. Do you need the session ID in order to? <laughs> I'm not sure whether or not you need to type a session ID, but if so, it's 943-17675. But So it, you might see a seat map, and I don't know if there's an option if I can't find my seat or click something kind of random, but then the idea is that it, it might pop up someone who's already near you. But um, the point is to talk to somebody and introduce yourself. Yes? Okay. <laughs> well, this is a test run. I'm not sure how it's working. Actually, you want to do one more question? Let's do that. So I go in here and go to question two and start it. <laughs> oh, I don't want to show question three yet. No. Two. Deliver, sorry. 
This is a multiple choice question, and most of the questions that I will be giving this semester, starting on Monday, will be multiple choice type questions, um, which I can even put sometimes a, a whole um, a histogram up on the front screen about it. Let's see what's going on, on the other screen here. Yeah, so you can see right now, as you're voting, the different responses. 209 people have voted. Um, whoop, let me go there on this one. I'm already getting too mixed up with all of my technology here. COVID masks. So what do you think? A, I'm wearing a mask right now, and it makes me uncomfortable that other people here are not wearing them. B, I'm wearing a mask right now, but I feel comfortable being in a room with maskless people. I do not know. C, I'm not wearing a mask right now, but I feel comfortable with uh, other people choosing to wear a mask if they would like. Or D, I'm not wearing a mask right now, and it makes me uncomfortable that other people here are still wearing them. <laughs> so. All right. And you can kind of see on the screen there that it's about 50-50 are reporting B or C. Although to my eyes, it seems like there's more unmasked, but I don't know, about 50-50. And this is sort of what I'm hoping, is that we settle on B or C. Masks are not mandated, but let's face it, a mask will help slow or stop the spread of contagious diseases, because these things are airborne. Also, the common cold can be airborne. So if you're wearing a mask, it's kind of smart. Um, and I think we should all respect that. People don't want to get sick, right? I, right now, am not wearing a mask because I believe that the risk of me casting a, a contagious disease here, the increased risk by not wearing a mask, is kind of worth it because I don't want to wear a mask. So, and there's no mandate. So that's my choice. But please respect everyone's choice. And I have a, actually a colleague, Professor Diamond, experimental astroparticle physicist searching for dark matter. These are some of the courses she's teaching, but on, I follow her on social media, and she posted, whoops, <laughs> this is time to yell at me. Can't all. I didn't hit switch my different laptop. This is like all the juggling of all the, <laughs> I have two laptops, and three, anyway, okay. This is Professor Diamond, and on her uh, Facebook, she said, if someone is wearing a mask in a situation where possibly no one else is wearing a mask, please don't say, hey, why are you still wearing that? Or when are you going to take that off? Or anything along those lines. They may be immunocompromised, uh, maybe a caretaker of a vulnerable senior or baby. Um, they might find the mask actually helps them with allergies or whatever. It's not really your business, so please respect their choice. So that's where I'd like us to settle. I think I'm just going to leave that thingy on in case you're still working on it. Oh, we're going on to the next part. So this is from Innis Life, another social media thing. <laughs> it's about checking over your course syllabi. So if you go on the website for this course, there's something called the syllabus, and this will be true for every course that you take. And the syllabus is like the rules of the course, and it's really important that you read it. And um, here Alex even suggests that putting all important deadlines, even including small homework assignments or problem sets, into a digital calendar system like Google Calendar or Notion in the first week of class. You can then set timed reminders in case you are often forgetful. The semester goes by a lot faster than you think, so those papers that seem far away are actually not. So we're on part four here, which is called Please Read the Syllabus, but it's just a few things I want to go through. And if I can find my little slide advancey thing, I can do it this way. Uh, this is just a, an overview of the course. Yeah, the idea here with the first 11 chapters of this book is kinematics, dynamics, momentum, energy, force, uh, friction, work, power, angular momentum, oscillations, waves, and sound. And if there's enough people here when we get to waves, we're, we should probably do the waves just to have, just try that in Con Hall. Um, and along the way, I'm hoping that you also kind of learn how to approach problems, problem solving in a systematic way. That's part of what we're trying to do here. There's a co-requisite is recommended. You don't have to be in a calculus course to take this course. It's algebra-based. But if you are going to go on to take second-year physics courses, then you might find 
that these courses are, um, uh, are actually required prerequisites for almost all the, the second year physics courses. And the exclusion is Physics 151, another course I'm involved in, but it's, it's the calculus-based sort of version of this. Oh, and I also want to say, there's a video over there, I want to say hello to the online asynchronous section. <laughs> so just to, just to clear something up, there are two uh, uh, sections for this course. The LEC 0101, and that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11 to 12 in Con Hall. And then there's LEC 5101, which is the asynchronous online section. So I, d I don't want you to feel left out if you're in the online asynchronous section for whatever reasons. You, these students are watching videos of this class at their leisure and doing these learning catalytics questions within the 24 hours. So my goal here, <laughs> if I can, is to try to treat both sections the same. <laughs> so why did we even, I don't know, but, uh, but basically if you are here and you miss a class for whatever reason, if you're in the LEC 101, you can just go online and watch the video and, and do the learning catalytics within that 24 hours, for example. But I kind of think it's better to come here and see what's going on and discuss things. I, I, I would like you to give me a chance and to tr try to attend. But I, and, and, so, and conversely, if you're in the online section and you find you have the time or want to come to Con Hall, you are more than welcome. I can see plenty of seats here. There's the, <laughs> the balconies are completely empty, so there's lots of room in Physics 131 for every single student in this course to come if they wish. So. This is a message from Roya, who, who also is a little busy. She's the one training her TAs and, and, and coordinating all the practicals. Um, this is uh, an announcement that she posted this morning. Uh, there's a sort of a PRA syllabus to telling you all the details about um, what's going on in practicals. Um, the first real practical section will actually be the following week when you really meet your first two, your, your two TAs. Next week, you will complete a survey in the practicals rooms. It's in person, um, and it should not take more than about 45 minutes or maybe as much as an hour. It'll be the first hour of your two-hour practical section. You'll be doing a, a survey. And it's either in room 122 or MP122 or 123. I'm not quite sure which, because uh, they each hold 35, 36 students. So um, to find your group, you can click on the groups tab, or if you can't find that, uh, April's going to be posting uh, lists on the on the cork board just outside these rooms, and you should be able to see your name on the list, so you can just go to the correct room. And that'll be your room for the, for the rest of the semester, for the real practicals, which start on the week of September 19th. I think I should check the discussion board to see what's going on here. I gotta refresh on that. Nothing. You good? Like I say, kind of shouting at me as a is acceptable in this class. Okay, what's next? Oh yeah, so it is important to put in your calendar two term test dates, which, strangely enough, are on Tuesday evenings. Basically, I do not think that 50 minutes is enough time to sit down and write a proper physics test. I had lots of 50-minute midterms when I was a physics student, and something about me is that it takes me about 20 minutes to kind of calm down when I sit down in front of a term test. And then in the last 20 minutes, I'm completely freaking out because of, of the clock. And so for a 50 minute test, I had a 10 minute sweet spot in the, <laughs> in the middle <laughs> where my brain was functioning properly. And it, I, I did very poorly on these kinds of tests. So this one's more like an hour and a half, uh, but it has to be on Tuesday evenings. Um, and then there's gonna be a three hour final. Um, and during the term test, you can bring in an aid sheet in which you can write down any equations or any information or example problems or whatever you want. Um, but you're not allowed to have little like fold outs or microfiche or a magnifying glass or something. That, you know, just stuff you don't want to memorize, you can put on an aid sheet. You can also bring uh, a calculator, a non communicating calculator. It can be a graphing calculator. It can store lots of stuff in there if you want. It's fine. Um, but it, it can't have like infrared communication capability. So, so, so basically, you can't have a phone during a term test or a final exam, nor can you have a smartwatch, nor can you have smart glasses <laughs> or 
or any kind of communication device. That's the idea with a term test or a final exam is you have to do it yourself without communicating with anybody else. Okay. But for every other aspect of this course, we do hope that you're communicating with other people and, and, and discussing things and, and learning collaboratively. So just to elaborate, what time is it? How are we doing for time? We're doing great. All right, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so my lab and mastering has three components to it. So let me say a little bit about this. Yeah, I'm doing great for time, because it says 11.44 on this, so we're even three minutes ahead. Um, so dynamic study modules and the homework assignments, these are all homework assignments, but the idea is that the DSMs are meant to be you kind of make mistakes on them and, and try to follow along with the reading. They're pre-class reading assignments. They kind of get you uh, encouraged to, to go through the book and kind of get familiar with this stuff. And there's, there's infinite tries before the deadline um, and, ev and eventually you kind of get through it. Um, the homework assignments are meant to be like post-class. So after we've discussed it in class, after you've worked on some of this stuff in practicals even, um, it's taking you through physics problems at a similar level uh, or even sometimes harder than you'll see on the term tests and final exam to give you some real practice uh, doing these things. And they're, they're automatically graded and it's a pretty good system. And then C is these in-class learning catalytics assignments. I think I have two more questions today actually. So, and then we're gonna weight it to be 100 points for A, B, and C, add them up, and then cap it at 200, meaning that um, in that way, as long as you participate and do well in at least two-thirds of, of the available activities, then you're going to receive a perfect score on that 10% of the online assignments thing. So also for that reason, accommodations for missing some of these things will generally not be granted. Um, you can feel free to miss up to a third of it, and that's, that's fine. So, but I mean, it's fine to send an email if you want to, to, to me or April if, if there's something does come up, if you can, <laughs> God forbid if we catch COVID or whatever and need to, to take a week off or something. Um, although these are all online, so you could do them from home anyways, but, uh, but if something comes up, please try not to sweat it too much. And um, the first two A and B are kind of based on your eventual correctness. There's lots of opportunities to, to, um, to try again, but you, it's based on correctness, the mark. Um, as for the learning catalytics assignments, I think it's 80% participation only, doesn't matter what you answer, and a little 20% boost for correctness. So if there is a correct answer, which there sometimes isn't, then it can give you a, a little extra uh, boost by getting it correct. On the first try. Okay. And we're actually on the fifth thingy here where we're going to talk a little bit about physics if there's no pressing questions. It's good to read the syllabus, too, <laughs> as everyone says. Yes? Yeah, that's a great question. No, so you don't need to bring anything to the practicals. We're going to give you um, uh, a blank lab notebook. Um, they're kind of, they're not huge they're like thin lab notebooks, but that's, and then you need something to write with. It might be good to bring your calculator, and that is all you need. You don't need a lab code or any, or glasses or manual or anything. It's all going to be uh, online, and there's computers in there, so that th you're at your little table, you can, can see everything you need to see. This is a great question. Yes? So maybe I'll do it him, then, then you. <laughs> No, 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 you don't need a graphing calculator. You might need to like press the sign button or the cos cosine, you know, so it should have those buttons on it, but even a little cheap $12 Casio, it would be perfect or T. So that's all you need. Yes, question? Uh, is there any pre-lab stuff? Um, you can look on the practical syllabus to check that out. I don't think so. It's possible to read ahead and look at what's coming. So it's a great question. Um, but I don't think there's a, an official like quiz or something before the practicals. I can check that out. Roy is not here. Maybe we do, let's just do one more question, then we'll do it a little bit. But, but I saw your hand first, so yes.
That's a great question. Will you get a formula sheet? No, so you will have to write the, the formulas down on a, on a piece of paper. I kind of um, think it's good for you to write down what are the important equations in this course on a piece of paper. You're going to know what they are because <laughs> you're going to need them. If you need it for, a, for the homework, you might need it for the term test, right? So it's good to just keep, a, keep, a, keep track of those and keep it on a piece of paper. Also, when a, I think when a professor gives you a formula sheet, it's, all, it's organized the professor's way, right? And I, what I want you to do is organize it your way. Whatever works for you to do your homework, just bring that in. And it's kind of like, <laughs> I always felt it was like my little security blanket, I, my, um, my uh, aid sheet. Okay, and I, so the next thing I wanted to do here, and I might have some time for some more questions a little later, but this is one of the interesting things about Atkina is that uh, this textbook kind of follows a scientific method that really resonates with me and makes a lot of sense because this is the way that I do science and that every physicist I've met kind of does it, which is that you start off at the top of this little chart thing with it's basically playing around <laughs> and just kind of looking at stuff and messing around with something in the lab sometimes or just opening your eyes and looking. I have a, a friend, Stephen Morris, who just was looking at icicles and noticing like the ripples on, on icicles and he's spent you know 15 years of graduate students I don't know how many PhDs working on why are there little ripples <laughs> on the icicle and what sets that distance scale so um, first of all you just look around and then what you're looking for is some kind of pattern or something kind of interesting and then you think it's called hypothesis stage where you try to think about why it might be like that <laughs> And so you try to explain what it is you're seeing. And then, next thing is that you can try to test your hypothesis. So you try to make some kind of an experiment that could go one of two ways. It could either kind of support your hypothesis or it could disprove your hypothesis, right? And so then you ask yourself, okay, now that I'm looking at the test, what happened? And usually <laughs> your test says, oh, wow, well, it's totally wrong. And so you can revise. You can either revise your hypothesis, or you can just say, well, I don't know what the hell is going on, and you can go back to more observational experiments. So you kind of go around the circle until you start to get outcomes that match your hypothesis, and then you start to feel like you've got a better handle on things. You kind of move on to applications experiments, okay, and, and, and trying to you know, design transistors which go into computers and, and help the rest of the world. So. That's what I'll call the scientific method. And getting close to doing a little demo up here, I think. Let me give you a, like a, an example of kind of trying to lead through what I'm saying here uh, with a real life problem. So, so this morning I rode along Bloor Street because I live sort of near High Park. And you have to, right now there's a bunch of construction, but you have to go down underneath um, some train tracks a couple of times. And you can, I don't know if you can kind of see it on this, but there's a choice. You can kind of go straight along the sidewalk, and which is helpful because of all the construction right now, but of course there's full of pedestrians, so it's not very nice. But, um, or you can go down the hill and up the hill and on, you know, stay on the, on the actual road. And so um, the question is, which side should get me to the other side faster? And I thought about that a lot. And so I I tend to go down because <laughs> I don't like going on the sidewalk too much and having, you know, scaring pedestrians and stuff like that. Um, but yesterday I saw someone hop up on the sidewalk and she got to the other side faster than me. So I think my hypothesis might be the straight line path is a shorter distance, so it should be the fastest. So. I have a little testing experiment <laughs> over here that maybe we could send to, to the video. Um, and in fact, I'll also make um, a little learning catalytics up to thingy. Deliver. Hopefully it started up a new thing. So you might see on your learning catalytics a new um, uh, video, but basically our new question, which is A, B, or C. So A will be a ball that rolls on a straight path B will be a ball that goes down and up. And if you answer C, it means you think they'll get to the other side at the same time. So you have two low friction balls. Pius, would you like to put it on video? Oop. 
Thank you. Hey, look, that's me. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> so I have a little camera up here. And uh, yeah, so what, is my, what does your prop actually look like? If I'm a little dot, <laughs> okay, up on the, uh, on the stage, because you're up in the... Uh <laughs> Hi, balconies. <laughs> it's great to see you. This is actually me. Ah! Maybe that was too close. <laughs> okay. But anyway, back to this. So there are two sort of low friction balls. So one of them's going to roll down and up. Well, <laughs> okay. And the other one's just going to roll straight. And they're going to start with the same initial speed to make it fair. Well, so we'll make maybe A will be uh, the white ball, and uh, B will be the kind of orange ball. You guys want to make a prediction? <laughs> I'm going to hold you to a prediction. Let me give you, uh, let's set a timer for one minute, and you can discuss, make a prediction. Then we're going to do another thing which will be observed. Is your one minute timer. Can I shine laptop two for a second? I'm gonna you want to send it to the side? Or? I'm gonna stop delivery. Yeah, I think maybe it's to the side. Yeah, that's a good idea. Going once. Going twice? <laughs> okay. Okay, I think it's good. Even if you're right or wrong, doesn't matter. Obviously, with the, all of these learning catalytics, you're getting participation. This one actually doesn't have right or wrong because it's a prediction anyways. Um, but I can see that 32% are voting for A, 19% are voting for B, and 49% are voting for C. Can, I, can we go maybe hide it again? We'll go to laptop. No. Aux plate? That's off. And you be quiet, you. Okay, good. So we're now we're going to start the next one, which does have a right answer, which is going to be observed. So don't, don't do this until you see it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Wait a minute. Maybe there was a trick there. Hold on a second. Let's observe again. Let's switch it so that B is the white ball and A is the orange ball. Should we try again? Maybe there was, sometimes you have to repeat an experiment if it doesn't come out the way you want it. <laughs> huh. Maybe it's better not to go on the sidewalk, eh? Let me do it one more time. So this is zero friction, so hmm. Let's do it one more time. Every time. Okay. <laughs> so, that was that. Oh, good. <laughs> if we now go to laptop two, send to all. You observed the same thing I observed, mostly. <laughs> Although I don't know about all of you, but did you guys see what I saw? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Like, you gotta use your eyes. Okay, so, so certainly uh, what I think is going on here is that um, B wins every time. And it actually doesn't even uh, depend on the exact shape of the, of the track. Um, so, so that's kind of weird. That was the testing experiment. This hypothesis that the straight line path 
um, which is always the shortest, um, that is, I guess, true. So this would mean that it should have been A, right? I think, because A is shorter path. Should have been A. That would be my prediction. Um, so my observation is that it's B. <laughs> okay, so that means that something's going wrong. Either the experiment is wrong or um, uh, our hypothesis is wrong. So maybe make a new one is wrong. Something's wrong here because we've got a, a contradiction. So one of the things I could say is that, which is interesting, um, we assumed that the uh, speed was the same, I think. Like a shorter distance means you get there faster. That would be true if both balls were going the same speed all the time, right? And then one that went down the hill is going faster. So I think that's, that's the issue here. Um, we assumed, this, I guess, the speed was similar. Something about going down the hill made it a lot faster. Um, but actually, um, ball B, what's interesting is that ball B, if this is going like, a, like slow, and this is going slow, then ball B will go faster down the hill, while ball A is going slow, and then ball B will come back up to the same initial slow speed. Um, uh, B, B's speed increases on the lower path uh, due to gravity. It's rolling down the hill. So there's, well, gravity, I guess, pulling it down, and then there's going to be a normal force kind of pushing it in the in the horizontal direction. So our new hypothesis is that the horizontal distance is the same for both. But when you're going down the hill, there's kind of an accelerating force. The normal force is pushing you in the, in the positive horizontal direction towards the right, and that's going to increase the horizontal component of your velocity. And that'll go back down again when you get to the other side, but it'll only slow down to your initial speed. So at no time in the x direction will ball B ever be going slower than ball A. It's either going faster or at the same horizontal velocity, right? So um, the ball with the greatest um, average horizontal speed wins. So if you just look at the only the x component, you've got slow, slow, slow average, or slow, fast, slow average. And so that's why b wins every time. OK. So that was <laughs> a little bit of physics. I wish you a great weekend. My, next, my plan right now is I'm going to go out that door pretty soon, and I'm going to stand around. I'll be out there in like five minutes. I have to pack this stuff up. And then I'm going to stand there until 1230. So <laughs> bye. <laughs>